as I was preparing for this talk today, I was thinking about my own experience with celiac disease starting back, I hate to say this, nearly 30 years ago when I was a fellow. And celiac disease seemed incredibly simple at the time. I was training in Boston and someone named Michael O'Brien or Sister Margaret would come in and almost every patient that we saw with celiac disease was of Irish descent and they had very typical, com typical complaints of diarrhea or signs of malabsorption or anemia. And back then we didn't think that endoscopic biopsies were adequate so we used to do something called a Rubens tube capsule biopsy. Uh, and so we used to take the patients down to radiology to fluoroscopy and we passed a tube under radiologic guidance down into the small intestine, unsedated I might add. <laughs> and we used a negative hydraulic system to grab a piece of tissue and then you'd take the tube out and pray that there was a sample there. And so occasionally there wasn't and we'd do it all over again. And then three to six months later we'd go back and repeat the process and to make, establish a diagnosis of celiac disease, you had to confirm that there was histologic improvement. So it was quite an ordeal. So, but that's how we did it. Back then, it seemed very straightforward. We didn't know anything about gluten sensitivity. So it was, uh, it was entirely different. And now as I prepare for this and I read about and learn more about celiac disease, it's clear that the more that we do know, the less that we really do understand about this disease and it keeps changing and has changed dramatically over the time since I entered gastroenterology. So I'm going to start off talking about some of the autoimmune features of celiac disease. I'm going to talk about the association between celiac disease and autoimmune diseases. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to mention the issue of malignancy in celiac disease and finally I'll comment on some of the screening recommendations for those that have celiac disease. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And I'm pretty sure he was talking about a gluten-free diet back then. <laughs> so let's define autoimmune disease. It's a disease state arising from an abnormal immune response of the body to substances and tissues that are normally present in the body. And a prime example of uh, an autoimmune disease is celiac disease. It's an autoimmune small bowel disease caused by gluten in patients who have genetic susceptibility. In order for celiac disease to be present, there has to be immune activation which results in intestinal damage and then a wide range of clinical manifestations. As I said, many years ago we thought that celiac disease was limited to the GI tract and now we know that 50% of adult patients present with signs of disease outside of the GI tract and other symptoms. As far as celiac disease and other autoimmune disorders go, there's a high prevalence of autoimmune disorders in celiac disease and also in first degree relatives of those who have celiac disease. It's been estimated that up to 15 percent of patients with celiac disease have an autoimmune disorder. The risk factors for developing an autoimmune disorder are early diagnosis of celiac disease and those who have a family history of other autoimmune disorders. And we know that gluten-free diet has a protective effect. And one of the questions I get asked frequently is from patients with celiac disease who are completely asymptomatic and the question is why do I need to be on a gluten-free diet? And here's one of the many reasons uh, because it seems to have a protective effect against developing other disorders. So in order for these to occur there's a theme that will come up over and over during this talk where there has to be a genetic predisposition for these disorders, there has to be environmental triggers and then as John pointed out, there's a loss of the intestinal barrier secondary to dysfunction of the intercellular tight junctions and increased intestinal permeability. You need all three for disease to be present. As far as celiac disease goes, we have highly disease-specific IgA and IgG autoantibodies to tissue transglutaminase when there's gluten exposure. There's a process that takes place in the small intestine where small intestinal intraepithelial lymphocytes cause damage to the small bowel lining and it's thought that early diagnosis and treatment can revert the autoimmune process and prevent complications. So here's a case where celiac disease is different from some of the autoimmune disorders, other autoimmune disorders that I'll mention. 
Now, the list of disorders that uh, suggest celiac disease grows uh, all the time. So it used to be just gastrointestinal symptoms, but as you can see from this list, uh, there are many other uh, signs and symptoms that are now added to this list. So it used to be malabsorption, weight loss, diarrhea with or without abdominal pain, anemia, and bone loss is actually quite common, bloating and gaseous, gaseousness, which is almost every patient I see in my office, uh, unexplained weight loss, it can be due to abnormal liver enzymes, an abnormal small bowel biopsy when you're studying a patient for other reasons, dermatitis herpetiformis, peripheral neuropathy, mouth lesions, growth failure. The dentist will send in patients with teeth abnormalities and say, can you look for celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and then those that have Downs or Turner syndromes. So those are the common conditions. And then there are some much less common presentations. Most of these are anecdotal, but uh, I'll mention them. Pulmonary hemosiderosis, infertility, dyspepsia, amenorrhea, fatigue, patients who don't absorb their thyroid medications, seizure disorders or ataxia, constipation, and recurrent abdominal pain. And I think these two lists we have actually covered every patient I've seen in the last few years. Now, there are two theories as to why um, there's this association between celiac disease and autoimmune disorders. And neither has been proven, but they've both been put forward and both have their supporters. One is something called linkage disequilibrium as opposed to equilibrium, where the genes for responsible, that are responsible for celiac disease and associated autoimmune disorders occur together more often than would be expected by chance. The other theory is that untreated celiac disease leads to the onset of other autoimmune disorders. Now here's the same concept that I mentioned before in the diagram, and you see there are three components. One is the genetic predisposition, the environmental triggers, and uh, the immune regulation. And for an autoimmune disorder to be present, all three factors have to be present. So if you have a genetic predisposition and you have, uh, without the environmental trigger, uh, you won't have the autoimmune disorder. And this is important as we talk about treatments for these autoimmune disorders, because if you can prevent or modify the triggers, then you may be able to prevent uh, the onset of an autoimmune disorder. Genetic predisposition, an antigen, and loss of the mucosal barriers that prevent the onset of disease. When you start talking about celiac disease and autoimmune disorders, it basically covers the whole spectrum of medicine. So we've got liver diseases, endocrine diseases, skin diseases, neurologic diseases, rheumatologic diseases, cardiac disease, and then our wastebasket category of other diseases. But um, I'll mention a few that have been more widely studied than others. Diabetes and thyroid disease are probably two of the best studied. Addison's disease is another endocrine disease. Uh, which is uh, adrenal insufficiency, where there's a high prevalence in celiac disease, but in this disorder there's no response to a gluten-free diet. Thyroid disease is common to find both celiac disease and in celiac disease thyroid dysfunction is also very common. So the prevalence of celiac disease and autoimmune thyroid disease is estimated anywhere from 2 to 7 percent based on studies. In celiac disease, many patients have either autoimmune thyroid disease or thyroid dysfunction and have a threefold increased risk of thyroid disease compared to uh, the control population. And there have been anecdotal reports of patients with thyroid disease who have normalized after one year on a gluten-free diet. That's not the norm, but it's been reported. It usually will not take the place of medications. And there's also an increased prevalence of patients with celiac disease, autoimmune thyroid disease, and type 1 diabetes. And in type 1 diabetes, often the diagnosis of celiac disease comes at the same time that the type 1 diabetes is diagnosed or shortly thereafter. These disorders share the same HLA and non-HLA genetic loci. The prevalence of celiac disease is estimated at 4%. The studies range from 2 to 11%. And the risk seems to be highest in patients who develop diabetes early, less than four years of age, and correlates with the longer one has diabetes. And there's also a risk of type 1 diabetes and celiac disease before the age of 20. There's also a second peak at age 84. We now recommend that all patients with type 1 diabetes be screened for celiac disease. As we said, they share HLA genotypes. 90% have either DQ2 or DQ8 versus 40% of the population. In patients with both disorders, 
a gluten-free diet will prevent growth failure. It may or may not lead to better glycemic control. One of the reasons is, is that with a gluten-free diet, you heal the small bowel mucosa, you get better absorption, your sugars go up, and you may actually require more medication. Gluten-free diet does prevent some of the late complications of diabetes, and it prevents bone loss. There's an association between celiac disease and liver disease. Celiac disease in itself is one cause of abnormal liver enzymes. In the three disorders that I mentioned, PBC, which is primary biliary cirrhosis, there's a high prevalence of celiac disease. Um, in autoimmune hepatitis, the patients who have celiac disease do better on a gluten-free diet and may go into a sustained remission. And PSC, um, which is not a very common disorder, there's also an increased risk. Dermatitis herpetiformis, I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, alopecia areata, there's an association. Vitiligo is more anecdotal and somewhat controversial. Dermatomyositis is another skin disorder. These are the lesions of uh, dermatitis herpetiformis. There's a erythematous sort of papular blister-like eruption, uh, usually on the extensor elbows, arms, uh, shoulders, neck, back, and this is, was first described in, er, in the late 19th century, but it wasn't until 1966 that someone made the association that there was small bowel lesions associated with dermatitis or pediformis. It's extremely common in celiac disease occurring in up to 25% of patients at some point in their lifetime. Again, that same concept of an HLA predisposition, there has to be environmental triggers and some disruption in the immune system. In DH, there's active small bowel inflammation with or without GI symptoms. The circulating IgA binds to the skin, and then the deposition of IgA at the skin level uh, causes eruptions that you saw in the, in the pictures. There's a close association between celiac disease and some neurologic diseases. There's something called gluten ataxia, which is a type of movement disorder that's triggered by gluten. Uh, there may or may not be small bowel disease. Uh, it's thought to account for 36% of cases of idiopathic sporadic ataxia and a high prevalence of HLA DQ2. And as I said, only a small percentage have GI symptoms in this disorder. And peripheral neuropathies, where people lose a sense of uh, feeling in their distal hands and feet, uh, gluten sensitivity may be present at 34%. 9% of these patients are thought, are, have been found to have celiac disease, and again, high prevalence of HLA types. In rheumatologic disorders, uh, I'll mention the association has been shown in rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, and lupus. In cardiac disease, uh, celiac disease has been associated with dilate, dilated cardiomyopathy and with autoimmune pericarditis. Again, it's, with pericarditis, it's somewhat anecdotal. And then there's a host of other disorders that uh, we'll mention, psoriasis, sarcoidosis, ITP, pancreatitis, microscopic colitis, and enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma. In my practice, we do see patients with microscopic colitis. These are patients, typically, I'll say more women than men in their 50s, 60s, sometimes older, who present with diarrhea. And they don't have Crohn's disease, they don't have ulcerative colitis. When you do a colonoscopy, and do biopsies, you'll find inflammation uh, under the microscope, and it's a very well-described disorder, and these patients should all be screened for celiac disease uh, due to the high coexistence. So in celiac disease, there is a slight increase in mortality over uh, the general population. It's usually shortly after diagnosis in those who have a uh, failure to respond to therapy. We think this implies a beneficial effect of a gluten-free diet, there's a slight increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, including both B and T cell lymphomas. Small bowel adenocarcinoma is found more in celiac disease than the basic population, but it's a very, very rare type of cancer. And the enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma, uh, half of those are diagnosed at the time of their diagnosis of celiac disease. It's a very rare complication. It makes up one, less than 1% 1 of lymphomas and has a very poor prognosis. There are two types of refractory celiac disease, type 1, type 2. This lymphoma is found in type 2, usually within five years of the diagnosis of um, the refractory celiac disease. It what's, what makes it difficult to diagnose is that the symptoms are basically those of celiac disease, uh, pain, diarrhea, weight loss. The median age is 60, equal distribution between males and females, 
and may also occur in patients who do not have celiac disease. 25% of those are at more than one location, usually in the proximal small bowel. So as far as monitoring celiac disease, given this multitude of other disorders that are associated, here's what we typically do. At diagnosis, we monitor serologies until they normalize. We also assess nutrition at the first visits until the, param the abnormal lab values normalize. We recommend a bone density within two years of diagnosis. Liver enzymes should be checked at the time of diagnosis and every one to two years. And the same with thyroid function tests. We don't always go back and do a duodenal biopsy. And we do cancer screening for patients with celiac disease, the same as in the general population. Mammograms, PSAs, colonoscopies, pap smears. And so what I've hoped to show over the last few minutes is that the response to a gluten-free diet is variable. There's cause and effect between celiac disease, gluten, autoimmune disorders, not, which has not been proven and often is anecdotal. And as I said before, a genetic susceptibility. The antigen must be present to trigger uh, the immune disruption and then loss of protective functions of the mucosal barriers. Um, are you saying that there really are no scientific reports based upon research to uh, support gluten-free diets and other autoimmune Celiac. It depends on the disorder. So, it, you know, and some, yes, so in thyroid disease, for example, there are patients whose thyroid dysfunction resolved after one year on a gluten free diet. It's not, for, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it has been reported. Cer certainly in type 1 diabetes. Sure. If you email me, I'll send you the references. Okay. I was diagnosed with dermatitis aseriformis back in 75, a long time ago. So, um, but I was not put on a gluten-free diet until several years thereafter. I was taking uh, sulfuric for the symptoms to look bad symptoms. The gluten-free diet cleared up the symptoms. I've never been tested for celiac. Um, but now that I've had a gluten-free diet for over 40 years, is there any reason for me to be tested for celiac when I understand I probably have to eat some gluten to no. be tested? No. So there is one way of testing people on a gluten-free diet. And, it's, and by the way, the only answer is stay on your gluten-free diet. Which is what's going to be recommended. But if you wanted to know whether or not you carry DQ8 and DQ2, we can now test for those markers. But that's which is what I usually do first in patients who come to me, suspicious that they may have celiac disease, but we don't want to put them on a gluten-free diet. Um, if there's a really wide range of symptoms that are, may not even be digested, and then also a really wide range of autoimmune diseases that anecdotally are found to be present in patients with celiac, how do you think that the medical community can respond to prevent situations like this or mine where I could do an arthritis for 10 years, but then being diagnosed with celiac and going gluten-free clearly not. So first of all, back in 1975, it wasn't as well known that there was this association. That, so DH back then may have been a little bit different. Now, it's so easy to get antibodies for celiac disease that most pediatricians and internists will obtain them. I mean, they're readily available. So most patients who come to me have already been screened for celiac disease. Mm -hmm.